the tablets and so on. An example of one of the seamless experience you can look at is the wireless display that you probably had a chance to look at. It. That's an example where you can take a display called content from one device and display it anywhere else to enhance the experience. Or you can take the content being displayed on TV, but take it back to a computing device to enhance it with a lot more content and so on. So the seamless experience should go across multiple devices. Uh, if I'm watching the content on a TV and suddenly I need to go run, a, run up and pick up my daughter from school, I should be able to move that content easily to my smartphone and continue to at least listen to or uh, 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 continue the experience as much as possible on that particular device. And that has certain implications from system architecture perspective that the same content may not run the exactly the same way on another device, so you may have to do uh, content transformation and so on. So that's the idea of computing uh, continuum. The other part of this is that as more and more services are being launched, you'll see that a lot of the data analytics and data happens in cloud. And since you have these multiple devices, carrying your identity across uh, multiple devices and be able to connect that to the cloud to offer higher level services is another example of compute continuum. So that's another uh, thing that we are trying to deliver to the customers in partnership with our OEMs and so on. So I think if you look at the embedded SSL, the landscape is pretty diverse, it's pretty fragmented, uh, because uh, as uh, you can see that embedded devices start from handheld smartphones all the way to personal health monitoring devices. In between you have digital TV, set-top boxes, traditional embedded space such as microcontrollers, print imaging devices and so on. Automotive is, uh, there are more computers in a car than in many other systems. Uh, and by computers, I don't just mean microcontrollers, but more and more sophisticated computing devices. And the personal health monitoring devices are becoming more sophisticated with respect to elderly care, as well as providing interactive feedback to people who are chronically uh, ill or people who, take, uh, who need to take care uh, in terms of uh, 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 chronic illnesses. And they, all of these devices, one thing we'll find common is that they're increasing functionality and performance requirements. There's a lot more communications in terms of Zigbee or Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, those kind of communication uh, interfaces. A lot more media processing with respect to either uh, audio video or graphics kind of a processing and graphics display, more sophisticated display processing, and more and more sensors are becoming uh, integrated. You have accelerometers becoming very common, touch, different sensors being integrated into the platform. So I think um, uh, if you look at our item-based uh, platforms, we have a pretty comprehensive roadmap. Uh, you have seen so far we have had Menlo in the past, where we started Town is a big improvement with respect to reducing the stand by power by a factor of 50 or so. Uh, this was based on the Lincraft uh, Intel Atom processor. We, next year we'll be launching another platform which will even reduce the power further and power performance wise it will be extremely competitive with other uh, kinds of uh, uh, devices that are, are there. Uh, and that will be uh, uh, one example. But more importantly if you, if you look future we are going to have a lot more of these platforms which will continue to make it smaller, make the power lower, and increase the performance as we ride the Moore's law curve uh, from one uh, SOC process technology to another and so on. And I think uh, as we go across these platforms, we'll also see that we'll be providing diverse set of platforms. So not just one system on chip uh, device, but multiple of those to address multiple markets. So here's a sort of a road map with respect to how many SOCs we'll be launching. So if you look at for each process generation, we started with 30, 45 nanometer, 32 nanometer, we'll start seeing products coming out. Uh, in each of the spaces, we'll have multiple of SOCs being launched, starting from netbooks, net tops, handhelds, consumer electronics, and embedded series. And in 22 nanometer, we even plan to have a lot more SOCs. Uh, so the number of system and chip devices being launched will be a lot more and that will continue to explain. So I think this is the classic Intel play where once we start riding a particular wave of Moore's law, we take advantage of our process technology linkages. Uh, once we have the base uh, uh, architecture defined, it's very easy to create multiple variations. And I'll be talking about the base architecture, what we mean by that. Question? Yeah. 
So the ski using handheld is different features or just different frequencies? So the question was when you look at the handheld with multiple SOCs, these are different features or just different frequencies? There are different instantiations of SOCs based on different features, depending on whether you're going into the leading edge tech, uh, uh, device or uh, mid segment of the market and so on. So these are different. And there has been a gap between ultra mobility and the main core processors. <coughs> Will that gap technology close? And no, okay. you spoke too quickly. Please repeat yourself. Sorry. The ultra mobile chips, the Atom C, has been delayed in technology node versus main core CPUs. Oh, no, no. So the process technology we use for this is not synced up with the mainstream process. This is a separate process we are doing for SOCs. But in terms of timing, there's no difference. We have been launched them at the same time. So, let's say, then you use the four handheld there. So, when you said four Different IPs integrated. You may have image processing or camera in one, not in other, those kind of variations. No, not necessarily, not necessarily. And not so unique the, designs. the unique designs. Yeah. Yeah, be, be, be able to create multiple variations is very important for us. Yeah. Any other questions? So I think uh, one of the motivating factors for this, and this probably is something people have seen before, that the new mobile users on the go uh, are providing the impetus for lots of different functionality. But if you look at the explosion in smartphones, Android-based phones or Lego-based phones, the number of variations of the smartphone with respect to functionality is amazing, but that is all geared towards people who are going to be mobile internet users. And this was the estimate about two years back. It's, it keeps on going up. And that's across multiple geos, which have different cost sensitivity, uh, the uh, uh, form factor sensitivity, and so on. So when you start looking at that, you also see that with the new users come new workloads. So this is an example of a workload. If you go in this particular idea, there's a company which is showing the augmented uh, mobile augmented reality applications, including you can look at your idea, get the content, and so on. That's an example that you're visiting some place and you want to know what this particular place is that you're visiting. And be able to recognize the image and be able to specify what it is. So for example, this is a Palace of Wales. So that's an example of mobile augmented reality. These applications are becoming real. These are no longer uh, fantasy. People are actually uh, making those applications available. <coughs> Similarly, I think if you look at the handheld power, people are beginning to look at uh, providing virtual worlds, virtual life. So if you're bored with your first life, you can pl be playing in a particular virtual reality game. And that sort of functionality is available uh, at the palm of your hands. So if you start looking at these devices, the user interface also changes. Dictation, transcription of notes, all of these devices also increasingly touch-based or voice or speech recognition based. And that creates huge requirement for both uh, processing as well as uh, uh, functionality on these devices. So I think this is another illustration of mobile augmented reality, but I really encourage you to look at the demos that, that the company's name, I don't remember, Ingenia or something like that, that's providing the uh, providing real uh, application here uh, for both iPhones and for other phones. Uh, so you are visiting a site, you want to know what is this, when was this built, or you might be looking for information from your lab at desktop. And information typically is somewhere in the cloud, right? So the question is how do you merge this together? And you do that using mobile augmented reality that includes processing this, extracting some metadata, searching for that in, uh, through indexing of some image databases, and some of the searches happens on the locally, some of the happens in the cloud, and what you get out of that is the information uh, about a particular uh, uh, site that you are at. So for example, the smartphone itself will be responsible for image recognition, generating the metadata, matching with local database, and then also remotely matching it in the cloud, and then overlaying that information so that you get the information. That's an example of uh, future usages uh, which you have to be able to deliver in small form factor. And uh, towards that is where I think we look at Another ex example would be in terms of electronics with respect to TV-based uh, experiences that people are delivering richer and richer experiences. Another example 
and lots of embedded devices. Either the medical field, infotainment and car, you see more and more these usage models which require a comprehensive architecture. Any questions so far? Yeah. Technology. Uh, how we bring them to market is going to be decided by different market circumstances for different things. But the key part is to be able to deliver so many of them in one process generation uh, rather than one per generation or two per generation. Yeah, go ahead. Is this live? Oh, okay. Uh, I saw earlier you mentioned that um, you expect to see power and performance, to, power to go down and performance to go up on future SOCs. Uh -huh. And I was curious how you were going to achieve that. Was uh, I, I was thinking about the uh, Sandy Bridge versus Westmer? Are you going to incorporate more fixed uh, function features, or are you using a, a ring cache, for instance, for the graphics and CPU? So just, this is not a Sandy Bridge. This is not a mainstream computing, which is Sandy Bridge Westmer. This is a very different process technology uh, geared towards Atom-based uh, SOCs. So Atom has its own roadmap. Atom is much lower power compared to mainstream. Begin with, we started delivering very low power. We take advantage of the process strength, of course, the process technology, as well as micro architectural innovations and others to reduce the power. But I, it's not apples to apples comparison to compare against Sandy Bridge. That's so I think if you look at our uh, 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 architectural approach to this, what we are going to do is that we are going to create platform modularity in a base system on chip architecture. So for example, for netbook, we can have a base system on chip architecture. And then using that, if we have enough modularity in the architecture and the architecture, we should be able to then be able to spin off multiple of variations depending on whether we are targeting the handheld market, or embedded market, or digital home, consumer electronics market. That's the basic idea. So start with the base SOC architecture, use as a base, and these are derivative products, and standardize on a modular architecture. So adding and subtracting of IPs to create different variations becomes easy. Can you describe what your base SOC architecture is today? Yeah, I will talk about that in the next couple of slides. Okay. That's a very good question. What's the base SOC architecture? So I think uh, the base, base architecture, I'll have more detailed diagram in a minute, uh, is consisting of uh, atom cores, some other IPs which are very high performance, the memory controller, some kind of interconnect fabric, including third party IPs that need to be integrated based on some external standard based fabric and other accelerators and so on. That's a general idea. But the idea is to maintain I or Intel architecture software compatibility. One of the advantages we bring to the table is that I software ecosystem, which is very rich because of our uh, heritage from the PC ecosystem. So we want to ma maintain that software compatibility as much as possible so that you can take these devices into new markets but take advantage of the existing developer community and so on. The other is that we want to make sure that we continue to maintain the IA-based coherency and support high bandwidth media graphics traffic. So one of the advantages of uh, IA coherency model is that pretty rich and it has lasted for a long time. It can not only support the CPU core, atom core, but it can also support very high performance requirements from graphics and media. Yeah. So for uh, IA compatibility, um, it seems like it that's a little tricky in the sense that your friends in Oregon and in Israel are doing their very best to uh, extend the architecture on a consistent basis. Um, do you, ex for instance, AVX, how do you anticipate keeping up with that over time? So I think uh, the question is again coming back to the mainstream, right? The mainstream guys are always going to lead with respect to architecture extensions and so on. What happens to the atom based architecture? and compatibility, how do you maintain it? So far we have done pretty well with respect to Atom, right? I think uh, how quickly we can sync up with the mainstream is going to be always the challenge based on the product roadmaps and so on. But the idea is to maintain as much compatibility. A lot of the software compatibility I, uh, I'm talking about is really backward, not forward looking. Okay, that's where the ecosystem takes advantage. Because if you look at any of the architecture innovations we introduce, software community takes time to catch up. Software developers don't immediately rush up to uh, rush in, but that's why man, taking advantage of the existing ecosystem and maintaining backward compatibility is very important. 
But thanks, uh, the, the good question. So I think uh, we are also going to maintain com compatibility with the micro uh, shrinker of operating systems such as PC Linux and Microsoft Windows. That's very important for netbook market, tablet market, and so on. And also, as I said earlier, that it's important to take advantage of the third-party IPO e ecosystem as much as possible. And they may, uh, might be supporting some external standards that we need to continue to support. Yeah. How many what? Apps, How many IOs? You have the base, you have the CPU, and you have the app. And you take the third parties, the third parties, and the third parties, and the third parties, and the third parties, and the How many of these third party IO hubs are you going to need? How many I'm going to need? That depends on how many third party IPs I'm incorporating. Right. If you look at Mostown, Mostown has a number of IPs, which are external IPs. No, my actual question was, uh, you have Mostown in IO Hub. IO Hub, yeah, okay. So this IO Hub has specific interviews. Some are related to USB, some are related to other things. Like you have So if you're talking about IO Hub, I want to make you understand, this is the Tunnel Creek discussion. Uh, in the context of Tunnel Creek, if you're talking about this, the IO Hubs are external to the chip. Those are external to our die, right? I'm talking about on-die integration of third-party IPs and IOs, not outside. Yeah. So I think some of the common questions that I get uh, typically when I talk about architecture is that what kind of standard interconnects you have. So I'll talk about the IO interconnect, which is a single common interface, some kind of a memory interconnect, that has to provide modularity in the not complex, so-called not complex that we use the term. And also we need to provide memory interconnect that provides trade-offs between low power versus high performance processing. Versus if you need some kind of custom arbitration or scheduling to support low latency applications, isochronous traffic, and so on. The thing is that either when it comes to the files versus controllers, we need to provide standard interfaces that are industry standards. And also, as I said, that when it comes to integrating third-party IP blocks, we need a unified software framework. Because, as I said earlier, we need to maintain this, the software uh, compatibility with the ecosystem. So the software framework is to take that into account while supporting third-party IPs. And finally, I think to be able to allow people to quickly develop applications, we have to provide a common development environment and debug tools for it. Yeah. Would this one or is this already uh, in terms of let me talk to this picture and that might help you. Okay? So this is the architecture I was talking about as a common basic architecture. That you have a bunch of atom cores, one or more. You have some kind of a low power memory interconnect fabric that supports uh, quality of service and so on so that you can provide uh, support for high performance IPs like graphics, or the video encoder, accelerators, and so on. Some kind of a built in memory controller, right? And uh, 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 standardized interfaces for all of these so that you can easily mix and match different types of devices. And then the IO complex, which has some kind of a standardized IO interconnect uh, with a fabric, with a bridge to ecosystem fabrics which are coming from outside that allow integration of third party IPs and some native devices that we integrate ourselves such as communication. That's the base architecture. Now once you have this base architecture and you instantiate it for some kind of a netbook device, it's easy now to add and subtract IPs to create multiple variations. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Can you describe the I.O. and the memory fabric that you're using? Uh, at this point, I'm, I, I, I can tell you what characteristic it has without telling you much. But more, more, more importantly, this IO fabric must have compatibility with uh, a PC ecosystem. So software compatibility is very important. The memory interconnect fabric has to uh, support uh, a multiple of these agents, which are either high performance, high bandwidth requirements, or low latency. And it has to be scalable so that you can go down in power for devices that cannot tolerate uh, too much power. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the 
system on chip architecture, it's not about cores anymore, right? If you look at this particular picture, it's not just about the atom cores. There are a whole bunch of other things which are very important, which are very important from performance point of view. We are also integrating a lot more of these IOs and IPs, including some accelerators for maybe image processing, uh, 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 speech recognition, audio, and so on. So for those, the modularity comes in the form of standardized interfaces for IO, memory interconnect, or DFX, so that we can easily add and subtract. So we're talking about different kinds of modules. Yeah. Um, there are quite a lot of SOC companies that are dedicated to SOCs. Uh, in addition to having access to the IA architecture, are there other strengths to be built on that in terms of SOC design? So I think that's a very good question, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, there are lots of people who are extremely successful in system and chip design, right? What does Intel bring to the party? Uh, did I paraphrase the question correctly? Yeah. So I think, uh, first of all, we believe that the Intel architecture is a big advantage you bring to the market because of software compatibility and the fact that you can scale applications between, across multiple devices. Uh, process technology advantage that really our SSC process, I believe, starting with 32 nanometer, which is one of the best with respect to power performance, and it will continue to get better. Uh, but when it comes to SSC design itself, I think we can source internally lots of IPs, but we can also work with the third party ecosystem very easily given our relationships existing to integrate a lot more IPs. So I think the scale that we can bring to the party, and that's what I try to show with the product roadmap kind of slide that we can bring a much bigger scale. It's, it's a more uniform, uh, we are IBM, Integrated Device Manufacturing, right? So we have all these layers, including process technology, in one place. It's not a frag fragmented ecosystem that we have. Yeah. So when you talk about modularity here, uh, in the case of, say, video encoding, um, is the modularity such that that block is, is a dedicated, perhaps hardwired encoding block? Or, or is there any kind of sharing of the encoding of the processor for? So the question is that when you talk about video encoding or decoding, is it a sh dedicated fixed function block or is it some kind of a shared block with CPU with offload mode? Is it safe correctly? It, all of those are things are possible. I don't want to get into more detail, but I think more importantly, to be able to have uh, ability to in include fixed function block when the power performance are very important. And also allow for flexibility by which you can share uh, functionality uh, processing with CPU core. Atom core is also important. But for certain markets, it's important to be extremely power efficient where fixed function might get more sense. That's where the ability to take and subtract, add and subtract is very important. Yeah. Elaborating what, what, what I mean here, this could be gigabit Ethernet, this could be uh, the wireless communications, uh, by comms blocks, I mean any one of those blocks. Uh, this, this is nice as well. Pardon? Anything. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about specific parts which will be included. You saw some acquisitions we made recently and all, but I think uh, my goal is not to give you the exact roadmap about when what is integrated. The idea is to be able to create an architecture that allows me to do all these things. Same thing with third-party IPs. If you look at our most town platform, it's already shown integration of third-party IPs. We'll continue to do that wherever there's advantage in sourcing IP from outside. So the next will be a couple of examples of resources I would like to talk about, uh, which are for specific uses. Just starting with embedded platform. So I think here, I think if you look at the embedded market, uh, it's a highly fragmented market. I, mean, I think if I start counting the number of full-fledged market segments that are called embedded, there are lots of them, more than 40 at least. So the question is, how do you scale across all of these things? So one of the things we are looking for is that that some of the places where performance is important, we want the performance to cost leadership in those markets by providing high performance atom core and the graphics performance. But then again, there are lots of third parties who would like to create their own SOCs or platforms for market specific segments where we cannot scale up. We cannot address all of those markets. 
So we are allowing for ability to create IO hubs and marry those to our platform. So people can create their own IOHs, and we will work with third parties to create a wide variety of IO hubs to be able to do integration. If you look at the embedded market, it's, it's a very vast market, and where it differentiates is different IOs being integrated mostly. And finally, I think to provide timeless platform solution, we want to take advantage of the low power item roadmap to provide performance to water leadership. And then in the process, we want to add, address this market, industrial controllers, print imaging, residential gateways. Some of these markets already have ix86 solutions available. Uh, infotainment, which is a big thing from automotive market part of view, the medical is a very growing market, and uh, some of the other, uh, the government markets of interactive clients and physical security and so on. And some of these markets like government are also important emerging markets where the government owns, uh, uh, decides the direction for a lot of the equipment that gets sold. So uh, you probably seen this slide. This is our uh, e-series for the item processor. The, I want to talk about more generic model and then specific ones. We started out with 49, uh, uh, 45 nanometer process uh, CPU core, uh, which scales. It has a dynamic range uh, in both power and performance. It has uh, the compatibility with the Intel architecture with respect to HD as well as VTX enabled and uh, speed split step technology. Uh, enough uh, L2 cache to provide the performance in the performance sensitive markets. Hardware video acceleration with respect to the video engine that's emb embedded. That's hardware acceleration for video encode and decode to support multiple of these encode and decode formats. Uh, DDR2 support uh, up to 2 gigabytes with 32 bit single channel but multiple devices. And uh, if you look at integrated graphics, we, are, we have a roadmap now to go up and up here to provide 2D, 3D graphics support. Uh, I'll talk about that in the context of TV also. Uh, display controller in terms of dual display, either LVDS or STVO and PCI Express complex, so that allows us to do integration of other devices there. The How much you mean? Or is it like SPI? Yeah, yeah, SPI is the one example. That's, that's the standard, that's what embedded market requires. Yeah. Uh, so I think if you look at the more details of this architecture, which is based on the link graph, which was our also basis of the more stone platform uh, uh, that was on handle, uh, the, we divide the chip into two parts, north complex and south complex. The north complex is where we have all this functionality integrated with respect to memory controller, video decoder, encoder, LVDS uh, display, and graphics married to a single, process, uh, single atom core. And when it comes to South Complex, you saw the Stellarton also announced today uh, by Doug Davis in his keynote. Example is that what we integrate on the DAI is a whole bunch of required interfaces for embedded market, but also allow for this connection to the IOHs, which can be further customized. So idea is that by doing the integration of necessary things on DAI, plus providing this kind of flexibility, we can address multiple of embedded markets that are shown. Sure. 